Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. It's great to see you. Happy Monday. I'm a minute late. I'm telling you, it's it's a bit of a scramble. I hope that this is going to be okay because for some reason, there is a crazy amount of noise happening outside my window as if the world is coming to an end. I'm hoping that it's not um, a huge variety of noise too. So we'll see what happens. Let me know if the background noise is outrageous because if it is, I'll have to, um, I'll have to make a good decision. Good to see you. I hope you had a great weekend. I had a great weekend. Uh, so many adventures, so many rug hooking adventures. I can't wait to tell you. So in this episode, I want to catch up with uh, what we did over the weekend, hear about your weekends as well. And then I'm going to return to the festival slides that we're looking at of Robins from that Wisconsin festival. We still haven't finished those. You know what else we haven't done at all yet is looked at the rug hooking magazine. We'll see how far we get today. Um, so good morning to Robin. It's great to see you. And Beverly, good morning. You're working on another exciting piece. I love all your work. Kirsten, happy Monday in Vermont. Doreen, happy Monday morning, afternoon. I'll take either one. Cheryl, it's great to see you. Oh, is it thunder and lightning and heavy rain in upstate New York? Oh, I wonder if that's headed this way. It was blistering hot yesterday, kind of all weekend, which, which was nice. It's just a bit unexpected. It's a bit sweaty again. Um, unexpected, but a nice gift. I guess, I guess that's what they call it, Indian summer, right? Um, Cindy, great to see you. Sunny in 80s today. Us two were in the low 80s. It's hazy. That's got me thinking now. I wonder if there are storms on the way. Linda, great to see you. Oh, good, good, good. You know, as soon as I said that, th that noise stopped out there. I mean, it was really like, it was almost like, like jackhammer type noise. Um, Lynn, great to see you. And Michelle, April, Dave, good morning, everybody. Jane, great to see you. Here we go. Can you hear that beeping? Um, Jane, it was fun having our hooking with yarn class yesterday. That was a lot of fun. Angela, too was in there. Ryan, great to see you. Um, very fun class. It's been a very busy few days. I didn't realize that I put the Amish toothbrush class at the end of this past week and then hooking with yarn at one o'clock on Saturday and then last night, uh, sorry, Sunday, same day, our first uh, Designing Like Grandma Moses class. And I have to say, I feel it went so well. It was my favorite one so far because I really have gotten so into Grandma Moses. Uh, in, into that really sort of fertile crossover between rug hooking and folk art. And she is right there. She is the trailblazer who is right there. Um, it was just a great class. I found it so poignant that I almost made myself cry. I mean, you, you, talk, you talk in it up and talking about her life, which was a very, very difficult life, and her age and, um, you know, getting into that kind of wealth and fame, uh, like in your 80s, is amazing and inspiring. Uh, yeah, and chokes me up a bit because it just reminds us that everything is possible. It's never too late. All of those great cliches, they're all true, right? Even if they are cliches. Karen, great to see you. Ryan, did you notice? I don't know if you heard this yet, but we were talking last week about um, how there, you were saying there's not a lot happening in your area. Well, it's, it's going to be a while. The Atha Biennial was last week in Kansas City. But the next biennial, which will be obviously in two years, is in Texas. Um, I think it's in, is it in Fort Worth, I think I heard? So that will be nearer to you. So that's interesting. That's a big to be continued. Um, oh, Jane, you're watching all the coverage from the Queen's funeral. That is such, such an event. I, you know, I, I really, I really love the royal family stuff and all that. But I lived in England for many years and I worked in the theater there. Um, obviously, before way before I had the kids, when I was you know doing all my undergrad stuff, and um, what a beautiful city, what a beautiful place, and I and I saw the Queen from time to time driving by in her car, um, I, as I guess everybody who spends a lot of time in London does, and she was always so the cutest little button in the back seat, you know, just waving out, and um, yeah, it's just one of those institutions you just thought that she would forever be there, and of course that is just not the way life goes, uh, but I have to catch up on some of that later because it does look like a lot of Expected pomp and circumstance, as it should be. Uh, Karen, good to see you. Cat's Gallery, good to see you. Lisa, good to see you. Linda H. in Massachusetts, oh, I'm so glad you're there. Good to see everybody today. Fort Worth is 20 minutes. Uh, oh, so that that's going to be great. I don't, I, I'm, I haven't planned that far ahead because that for me is very far. Uh, but I know there's going to be a lot of good names, a lot of good people there, and it is so far away. We'll have to see what happens. You will be there for sure. I know that, right? Anita, great to see you. Happy Monday. 
So let's catch up on a bunch of things today. Um, what a weekend. I'm telling you, what a weekend. So many things um, happened that I want to share with you. I will see what we'll see where we get to because I want to show you some stuff too and not just run my mouth. So on Saturday, um, I drove down to Rhode Island because it was the meeting of the Little Roadie Thrummers. Remember, I was going to head out and do that because they have not met, met since um, COVID, right? So this is like their first meeting. And uh, for the first meeting, it was like the event that you pay, you pay your $20 for the year, which I think is a steal. And you're good from September to May. And that's when they get together and meet. They also get together and meet every week um, upstairs at the Stop and Shop. And that's one of our grocery chains in this part of the country. Maybe everywhere. I don't know. But um, I just thought that's a great idea because, you know, for people who struggle with places to meet, sometimes you don't think about, I mean, it sounds crazy, but sometimes you don't think about the grocery store. They do often have rooms upstairs um, that they're very happy to let you have for, for like no money or very little money, but I'm thinking no money in this case. So they meet there every week. And I think how convenient is that? You bring your bag, you do your hook in, you catch up with your buddies, you go downstairs, you grab the milk and the creamer and all the things that you're out of. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Um, it doesn't have to be charming. It just has to be convenient and available and inexpensive. So I think that'll be um, interesting to think about um, finding more meetup spaces because that usually is the kicker that prevents people from getting together often is the amount, even like a church often charges you to be in the basement. So anyway, they have figured a lot of things out, the Little Roadie Thrummers, and it was a wonderful meeting. Um, let me show you. I'll just give you an overview of the day, and then I want to show you some of the slides they always have a speaker, which is really nice. I will be the speaker in January. I'll be doing a live presentation on the Alice Butler rugs. I've done some of that for other girls over Zoom, but this would be a live presentation. So that should be a lot of fun for me and hopefully for everybody. Um, so if you're around and you want to see that live, make sure you get in touch. You get in touch with the Little Roadie Thrummers. They also have a Facebook page. Um, so that's coming up in January, something to, something to look forward to. Uh, later in January, I'm doing that, a great program also local to me in Connecticut here um, at the new Canaan Historical Society. And, you know, it, it is going to be, it's a very wealthy historical society because it's a very wealthy area. It's easily commutable to New York City, and it's one of those uh, Fairfield County towns, you know, um, that is quite wealthy. So they have an extraordinary amount of nice things there, including a heavy emphasis on weaving textiles. The person who originally lived in this colonial house that is the basis for the museum, one of many buildings now on the grounds, um, was a textile person, uh, had lots of looms and little tape looms and lots of things like that were kind of in our sweet spot, textile -y stuff. So um, I'll be doing that um, also in January, doing a presentation there that will end in a class for people that want to take it where we are recreating in miniature uh, the one hooked rug they have in that house, but it is a whopper, and it is not a commercial pattern. So it'll be great to celebrate the history of that house, um, the history of that family, by recreating this very, very old rug. Um, that'll be a lot of fun. I'll put all that information out. This group needs a record uh, to record. Oh, um, you know, maybe they will. Maybe they will be able to do that. I'll, I'll ask Peggy about that. She's the president. Um, yeah, I'll have to see if that if that can work. That could be a lot of fun. So it's going to be a great meeting. It was a great meeting this week. So this is where I started. Let me show you some visual aids before it gets too boring. Um, let me show you. Now, this is where we left off. Don't let me forget later. This is a slide we left off in, in on the festival, and I don't want to get, um, n if you can remember, number 23, just in case I forget. Let me show you what I was up to this weekend, because I think you're going to fall in love. Um, you know, I didn't take a bunch of pictures at the guild meeting. There were quite a few people there. I was just in the second row. And um, Peggy O'Connor's up front there. She's the president of this chapter. It is not not the chapter. They are a standalone chapter, the Little Roadie Thrummers. Uh, they, do what, they do things their way, exactly the way that they want to do them. And that is the way that it works. And it works great. So she did a presentation, as you can see, on dyeing with natural um, materials, right? So plants. And it was a very in-depth, uh, interesting. I didn't want to take pictures of every slide because I thought that's a bit predatory. But um, she did a great presentation, and it was specifically about dyeing wool as opposed to yarn. I mean, essentially, are they the same thing? Of course they're the same thing. But um, it is interesting and nice to see these beautiful pieces of wool um, that she has dyed as a result of her 
recent adventure. She's been doing this since August. So she was using for the colors on the table, which are all yellows and browns, she was using plants that are easily found in Rhode Island. Uh, this is something, this is a conversation we need to continue because we are about to start our dying slash Halloween month in October. Heavy, heavy conversations and videos on dying and emphasis on um, Halloween celebrations, fall celebrations, that whole lead up to, to the beginning of our holidays here. So she used Queen Anne's Lace, which is this beautiful white plant you're probably familiar with, and Goldenrod, and Tansy. She used a lot of different things, but I thought it was interesting um, that the emphasis was on things that she could find. Now, this is something that I want to talk to you about because I didn't get an, I didn't get an answer on this. Um, and I'm wondering, because I know this exists and I don't know what it's called. So I think Peggy is more of a gardener than I am. And I think almost everybody um, on earth is more of a gardener than I am. And I hope that that changes when I have a little more time because I'm very interested. But I don't know a lot about gardening. So when I realized that her presentation was going to be on um, dying with natural, uh, natural dying with plants and things that you find around you, nuts and all kinds of things that you can find, you're obviously looking for specific things because not everything that is colorful is color fast. In other words, sometimes you are walking through a walking trail and you uh, brush up against berries and they seem to be like staining you like crazy, like it's never gonna come out of your clothes and skin, but they turn out to not be color fast and they wash out the next day completely with no trace. It's remarkable sometimes what things are color fast, which means they last or they can be made to last and what things are not at all. Um, so interesting, you need to know that part first before you waste your time plucking every nut and berry and piece of bark that seems to be quite potent in color because it doesn't follow that it will be color fast and last. It could be that it seems to be nice and colorful, you hook with it and your wool fades like in a month, in a year, completely. So these are things that are well-researched that you can find out online or with the different dyeing books. Uh, my favorite one is still the Jenny Dean book. Um, I think it's called Wild for Color, something like that. She had out the, uh, the, dyers, um, the dyer's book, Natural Dyeing for Rug Hookers, and it was, it was put out by Rug Hooking Press, so Amory Press, but it is not in print and it is very hard to find. I didn't see any immediate copies out there. I know I have that book somewhere, um, but it's hard to recommend a book that I think is gonna be very hard to find. And when I find mine, I will share all that information with you. So the point is it is well documented what you can die with. My problem and the part I would like some help with from you is she knows what to look for, right? Because she's, she's alert and she has done some gardening and she, this is part of her wheelhouse of knowledge. But for me, if I said to myself, this weekend, I would like to die with some Queen Anne's Lace and Tansy and Goldenrod, I would be able to find the Queen Anne's Lace, but to be honest, I don't know if I could find the other two things and the other hundred things that were on her list, some plants that I have never heard of in my life. So this is my question to you. I know, I know that like, for example, my sister sometimes when we're out walking and we're away for the weekend or whatever, and I go, oh, look at that, what's that plant? She takes out her phone and she takes a picture of it and she has an app on her phone and pulls it right up and she'll go, that's a Japanese maple. Now I know what that is because that's like my favorite thing. Uh, but that's the only reason I figured out what a Japanese maple was, was when she used that app. But she uses it whenever we're looking at stuff and we can't identify something that is quite beautiful. I wonder if anybody knows the name of any of those apps or has found another way to figure out what you're looking at because you do not want to be handling stuff that number one could be dangerous, could be um, allergy sort of ridden, could be uh, poisonous, poison ivy, poison oak, all of those things that can really get you. Um, how do you know? Do you all know? I mean, have, have you figured out ways to do this or is this just a crude knowledge that you, that you earn uh, by reading and learning? Um, I was just wondering because getting into this natural dyeing chapter, I have like tons of natural dyes that I have bought pigments for and powders for. But I would love to go foraging, and I just need to know a little bit more about it, I guess. So we went into this, um, this chapter meeting, and she did this great presentation on um, the natural dyes, and it really was interesting. And the thing that got her going on the whole natural dye um, idea was she's a Pearl McGowan certified teacher, and she was asked to teach something for some class coming up, 
and she decided to uh, create this very simple pattern with a squirrel, very seasonal pattern. And the squirrel had a little acorn. And she got this idea, well, what if, you know, fall pattern, very simple pattern, a uh, little nut, what if I could use acorns to dye some of the colors? And then it kind of, down the rabbit hole she went, right? Out, tumbled down Alice in Wonderland style, and then got going with, well, what else can I use? So that's what got her going. I thought that was a really cute backstory, you know? Karen says, there are wonderful books out there that tell you what, what plants are good for dyeing and what it looks like. Okay, I'm gonna have to do another Amazon search because the Jenny Dean book does that to a certain extent. I guess what I want is, is like, and this probably doesn't exist, a book for just my area because they show you all these wonderful plants and these sort of general knowledge or general info books for the whole country. Um, and then it's like, you know, there's only like a, a few things out of the whole book. Sometimes you get a map and it like shows you a highlight of your region. And I'm flipping through and I'm going, that's a beautiful plant. What a nice color it makes, but it's nowhere near me. Um, so I'm going to try to do some research and figure out if maybe there are books that are like, even like locally published books that are really focused on immediate areas so that we could all pick up the right ones for us. Because it's more like a scavenger hunt when you know that the thing you're looking for is actually there. Um, it's, it's, it's called a wind up when you go out and you're looking for something that you have no chance of finding. So this is all a new world for me too. The foraging part is something that I, I haven't done outside of like um, a few flowers and plants and black chestnuts in our neighborhood. I'd like to get way more into it. But it was a wonderful meeting. Master gardeners in your area might know. Robin, that's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea. Um, I think, you know, I think I might, as a starting point, because I belong to just about every historical society around here, I might send, like, um, some emails out and say, I wonder, you know how historical societies often have a gardener that volunteers and is very knowledgeable? Um, that might be a good starting point for someone to talk to. In fact, that, that historical society in New Canaan, the day I went to have a meeting to plan a couple of events, the talk, and then I'll be planning a group tour in the spring for the people who are local that want to look at the things that are, that are there, two separate events. When I arrived, there was a gardener on the grounds who, there was, there was like hummingbirds all over the place. This is just a crazy garden. And there was even a small fenced in colonial herb garden. I think I told you that, that really inspired me. Uh, all, fenced, all fenced off, this small little thing. It was filled with plants and smells that I felt like I was just transported to another century. It was so exciting, uh, very stimulating, very um, haunting kind of a feeling walking by. But I bet that that person, had I but thought of it, I, I was waiting for a while. I could have easily had a nice conversation. I think I'm going to circle back to her and see what I can find out. Beverly says, if there's a local master gardener's group, a local master gardener's group. So now two people have said that. I'm getting the sense that that's a thing. Uh, the master's gardener, the master gardener's group. I have never heard that expression before. Shame on me. Um, I think I'm going to Google that in my area. That's a great idea because again, in the month of October, we are going to be talking a lot about aniline dyes being chemical dyes, but also natural dyeing. I want to talk about both because I want to. I want everybody to be able to get involved if they would like to. Uh, Linda says found some foraging books for Connecticut online. Just need one for dyers foraging. Fantastic. I'm going to Google that too. I'm going to follow all these leads because this is like a big theme for me coming up. I'm just super excited. I know it's the wrong time of the year to plan, but it seems like the right time of the year to look for stuff. I might be wrong, but it seems like it might be. And what a lot of fun going into winter uh, with a bunch of uh, things that you can start dying with. So just like, yeah, that does sound good. Just like Peggy did with her foraging in August and making all these beautiful yellow colors. She said it's remarkable how many colors make yellow. So that'll be another sort of aspect to the planning is I love, I love yellow, but I would like to have some other colors. Um, so I'll figure out what things around me make other colors and we'll talk about that and, and evolve that a little bit better together. Ryan says, thanks for all the advice I've learned. I'm going to look online. Absolutely. What a lot of fun, right? Makes you feel like some kind of Renaissance person, right? Going out there doing all kinds of different things. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was very inspiring being with the group, hearing this talk. Um, it was just a beautiful day. Um, everybody was working on gorgeous projects. The show and tell was phenomenal. It was a lot of fun and they were working on their calendar for next, um, for the, the upcoming year. So it's all a lot of fun. Let me show you what else I did. It was just one of those days. I wish that I, I wish that I had a giant car and I have a Kia Soul and I wish that you were all with me because I was so 
it was a moving kind of a day, you know, in lots of ways. I, I drove over to Rhode Island, which is a couple of hours. Um, I left the meeting. I drove by the Jamestown Windmill, which is one of the oldest ones in the country. Um, I don't. I, they have a little historical museum at the mill, and I didn't have time to stop because I had about 100 things on my to-do list. But it was just, as you can imagine, the little millstone there. Uh, this mill I have only ever seen from the distance. You can see it when you're crossing the Newport and Jamestown bridges. At, right over that huge body of water, Narragansett Bay, absolutely beautiful. And the, the boat show was in Newport uh, this weekend, so I did not go anywhere near there. Jamestown is one town over. Uh, what a beautiful windmill. I always wonder if this is, you know, most um, windmills in New England were made from um, shipwrecked wood because people were so busy cutting down trees so fast to use for heat and for cooking and for building, uh, getting, getting towns started. Uh, that they preferred to use scrap wood because it, it, it didn't have a certain kind of nobody's name on it yet. They would just, as soon as something wrecked, which something always did, sadly, they would go and collect the wood and build windmills. Most of the windmills we see in this part of the country are made from wrecks. I'm not sure about the specific one, but I'll have to go back when I have a little more time and see what I can see. Uh, it was just beautiful driving around here. I'm just looking for our next slide. Hang on. I've got a whopper coming. I was driving around there and in the distance next to the mill was a beautiful Newport Bridge. Just beautiful. So inviting. You know, adventures. Adventures to come. Now, I took this crazy road down to this area called Shady, uh, Shady Lee. And it's a mill. And I drove down because I was told there was another rug hooker who had taken up a space in this specific mill. And I didn't know this area at all. And I was following my GPS. And it put me at this little house. This beautiful, very early American house. And I parked right across from it because the mill was like diagonally across from it. And there were no cars in the parking lot. But I got out of the car and I took a picture of this house because I thought, man, this looks like a hook drug. Doesn't this look like one of these beautiful little salt box, early American primitive type houses? And isn't this the ultimate willow weep for me tree? I mean, it just makes you want to cry looking at it. It is so beautiful. Um, I thought if there was one on both sides, it would be phenomenal. And it just put me in mind of so many rug hooking designs where you have a tiny little weeping willow tree next to an enormous house. And it's just not the way it goes in real life, is it? These trees are monstrously big trees. But how romantic. Look at the amount of shade that this tree gives. How romantic. No wonder we see these so often in our, in our rug hooking adventures. So I parked the car and I thought, doesn't look like there's any cars in the parking lot. This is what the mill looked like half brick and half wood, very inviting. It's a, it's a 19th century mill. Um, it was a former textile mill. And so I went in there and it was a bit of a, it was a bit scary, I have to say. I took out, I'm such a, I'm such an idiot. I mean, it's like such a safe area too. I'm, it just, I'm always like on high alert for no reason. I took out my thing and I opened my key just in case I had to like stab somebody if, cause it was, it was scary. There were all these long corridors. It had a bit of a Stephen King feel. And I could, my footsteps were like, boom, 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 and there was no sound, and it was a bit edgy. And I just kept walking around, and all of the doors were closed, like nothing was open at all. And I thought I might not be lucky here, because I'm not even sure what I'm looking for. Anyway, let's come back to the story. So first of all, I went to the door, and I saw this. Very encouraging, right? Beautiful wreath. Welcome. So I thought, by all means, I, I guess I will. So I went inside, and I finally found Deborah Wallant. And I didn't even realize that that's what I was looking for because somebody at the guild meeting, that she's who I was looking for, somebody at the guild meeting um, said, oh, there's another rug hooker in that Shady Lee mill. And I said, okay, well, you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm driving by that way because I was driving past the windmill and the bridge, and that's the way I was headed to go back toward the highway. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to pull over and I'm going to see if she's there because it's a Saturday. And I went in and I finally found this open doorway with all of this color inside, and it was Deborah Walland. And the thing is, Deborah Walland had moved um, for, I, I think, quite, quite a long time uh, into like the mid-Atlantic states, and she was doing a lot in Florida with Searsport. She did a lot of events, a lot of planning. Her company called Seaside Hooking is a big company. And I know that I was in touch with her emailing when I started my business a couple years ago, 12, 2020. And we went back and forth a little bit. And I'm not sure that she was already up here then. I don't think she was yet. But she ended up moving back up and taking a space in this mill. And I found her there. And we realized that we had talked back and forth quite a bit and then kind of fell out of touch because I thought that she was still like down south. 
So, um, God, what a fortuitous meeting. It was so wonderful meeting her. She was so lovely. It was unbelievable. It was like soulmate. I was so happy. Thank you. Ryan, you know, it's funny. This is, I've, I've been wearing this dress as often as I can because it's like a light linen dress and I love it so much. I just got it like a month ago. And, and Deborah said, why don't you stand on that side because you're near the greens and I'm going to stand on this side because I'm near the pinks. I ended up staying for a couple of hours and just talking. I bought a bunch of her wool because I always, always buy other rock hookers wool. And I hook my, my own like personal projects with it because I love touching other people's stuff. It's just more fun than playing with my own stuff, you know, uh, especially when you have a business. It's like you love, you love playing with other people's stuff. I bought tons of her wool. It was so beautiful and lush. And if you're on Facebook, you already saw some of these pictures, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But I went through her studio, and I took a bunch of pictures um, of some of her rugs that are fairly well-known rugs like these. I'm just doing some overviews here. Um, I saw some interesting things like this piece here that is a woven piece that she made completely out of sari silk. And if you look at the top bar that she started with, she loomed so that both the warp and the weft, vertical and horizontal, is made with sari silk, S-A-R-I. So, and she sells the sari silk too. So um, for those of you that have invested in sari silk, some people like to hook with it, some people don't. This is just another option of something that, that you can do. It's just a lovely, very high luster, really lovely piece. And I thought, interesting. A woven piece with sari silk. What a great idea. She also had a bunch of pieces that were my favorite pieces of hers that she did super, super, super wide cut with selvages. So when she does all her dyeing, she, she cuts, rips off the selvages, and then you have a very, very wide piece uh, that's getting close to an inch, if not an inch. Uh, and she uses those to hook these abstract pieces. Uh, wonderful use of selvages because they're very they're very hard to hook with because they're so wide unless you make them less wide. These are all selvage pieces that sh that she did. Um, I think this is my favorite. It was made up of the dark centers, but then all of these different colors of whites and lights and very light neutrals I thought were just a little bit of pastel in there, just beautiful. So this is another one of her selvage pieces. Um, and, and the statue next to it is another one she made because when I went into the mill, I first found Deborah in the room next door uh, with her little Boston, uh, not Boston Terry, I think it was a Boston, no, it was a Chihuahua uh, called Rosie. Rosie did not like me. I think she's just, she's being very um, careful guarding, right? Guarding against uh, strangers. Uh, no, Ms. Van, great to see you, Stephanie. Um, but she was next door with uh, her buddy who has the one space over and, and she is like a like a found um, um, found art sort of collage um, mixed media artist like sculptor so she finds bits and pieces of metal and old brass findings and things like that and she puts them together in these three-dimensional sculptural pieces and Deborah's gotten into that too so this is one of the pieces, and, and when I found her over there, she was not working on her rug hooking. She was fooling around over there with Donna, uh, making some sculpture, and what she was working on was just beautiful. But, um, you know, they're over there listening to music and chatting and having fun, and of course, why not, right? What a, what a lot of fun to be together and be inspired. And So that was a beautiful selvage rug of hers and a sculpture that she had made. Uh, these are just different vignettes from her store that I wanted to show you because she does have an online store, Seaside uh, Rug Hooking Company and a physical store. So you can visit her here too. You can be in touch with her. Incidentally, just so you know, if you are on Facebook, Deborah's Facebook group is called um, Hooked Line and Sinker. And, it, and of course, ours is called Rug Hooking and Aspersan Punch Needle Club. Hers is called Hooked Rug and Sinker. Uh, so if you are on Facebook, make sure that you belong to both. They're both really fun clubs with very friendly people. Um, I think both uh, Kirsten does most of the admin stuff with our group, but we just set a very friendly tone in our group, and I feel that Hooked Line and Sinker, um, that was the rug hooking group that I joined first when I first got going uh, with hooking and starting the business and everything. That was the club that I belonged to before I started my group, and it was always very friendly, um, very friendly club. So make sure that you check her out too. Uh, just beautiful amounts of wool color medleys that she puts together. This is another one of her selvage pieces that I just thought was really beautiful and remarkable. Maybe that's my favorite one. Very, very rainbow. Look at all those ends, right? 
Isn't that lovely? And then some signature pieces, you know, because when I think of Seaside Rug Hooking Company, I think of some really um, iconic hooked rug pieces like this one. This is so her style. It's just, it's just so her, right? The sea turtle, the, um, the, the little fishy, lots of plants. It's very abstract. It has a mythic quality to it. It's also very peaceful. Uh, when I remarked on her colors that we were standing in front of in that picture, she said they are Southern colors. They're very hot, colorful colors. And I said, you know, you're right. Uh, traditional colors that are more synonymous with New England and primitive hooking are, are much more sort of dulled um, in historic colors, although historic colors are remarkably, remarkably bright. I did not know that this was one of her pieces. I know that we covered this on a bingo night or one of our, one of our special nights because um, I know it, it was it appeared in like Rug Hooking magazine or maybe at the magazine, um, but I didn't realize it was one of Deborah's. I have this pattern and I've had this pattern for years. I bought it at Cushing and this is one of her patterns too. Um, and, and I can see it now too, right? The way that she likes to put in almost in a collage style, right? It's not surprising that collage appeals to her. She likes to collage in lots of different elements. She likes sea creatures. Oh, you know what? This is upside down. I am so sorry. Let me see if I can flip it while we're live. I wonder if I can. Hold on. Haven't tried this yet. Let's see. We've been doing a lot of sneakies lately. No, nope, still wrong. Wait a minute. Let me try again. Give me one, one more little hot minute. Let me see. I think I made it. There we go. Hey, I think that worked. It worked for me anyway. It's one of these dolphins, right? These are like super, super, um, the, the sort of European dolphin that you see on you see, you see it in America, too, Gilded Age places. They, they use the dolphin a lot in Europe and castles and uh, chateaus and historic houses um, at the bottom of a gutter, like on the side of the house. So the water comes pouring down, and then it comes shooting out of the dolphin's mouth. It's a fairly common thing to see on very wealthy old houses. Uh, but it's also, the, it's also the motif, the dolphin, for one of the big museums. Now, help me out. What am I thinking of? It might be... You know, it might be the Preservation Society of Newport. That's not overly famous, but, sorry, getting a phone call. Um, it might be the Preservation Society. If, if you know otherwise, please let me know. But anyway, lots of her really lovely, very Southern colored uh, pieces. Right? She does a lot with patterning. I was just in awe. It was a wonderful visit. Um, I love these kinds of pieces that she does too. I'm gonna tell you uh, one more thing about those in just a minute. It's just a lot of really classic kind of primitive stuff like this. Such a lot of fun going through her work and just being with her. This is the piece she's working on now. Um, she had this going at the table. And so these are like the kind of, you know, they have a more of a sort of an ethnic look to them, like the one I just showed you before, the one she's currently working on. This is, you know, I said, these look so different. They remind me a little bit of like the Mexican molas, but not quite. And she said, these are based on, have you heard the word Rangoli yet? I had not. Uh, and Rangoli means um, Native American sand painting. Mm -hmm. So I do know what sand painting is, but I did not know um, the word for it. So she supplied the word, and it is Rangoli, R-A-N-G-O-L-I. So I Googled that a little bit. And it's when you see, the name of her shop, April, is Seaside Rug Hooking Company. Um, she, when she described this, I went down the rabbit hole and I looked a little bit when I got home at night um, at what it was. And what it is, and I'm sure that you would recognize this as well, you know when you see sometimes at stores, new and old, because this is this is not a new craft, like little tiles and things that have a very sandy texture because they are made of sand, and they have created almost like a stained glass or a, a cloisonne kind of framework where they then pour different colored sand into different compartments to complete a picture. That's what Rangoli is. And I thought, you, you are such a clever little firefly uh, using this form um, to create hook drugs because it lends itself beautifully to making hook drugs. Really smart. Let me see what else I can show you. These are, I wanted to show you, I know I had at least one other, hang on. Um, yeah, I stopped, after that I stopped at an antique store where I bought a giant Swift that, um, it, it's a yarn winder. It is giant, it's a vertical one that I'll show you another time. I have it in the other room now. It is massive. Uh, that same store had this rug. I ended up not getting it. It was $95. It was very nice. It was falling apart in my hands. It was probably about 18 inches wide. Beautiful, original um, pattern. Maybe I should have gotten it. It was just so fragile. And it was in the window. 
it was rolled up the wrong way in the direct sunlight. I mean, it was just like, come on. And I undid it so gingerly and put it on the floor to take this photo for you. And pieces were falling off of it left and right. It just, maybe I should have just gotten it. I just feel like I just hemorrhage money like crazy lately. Um, and I didn't see displaying it immediately because it needed so much shoring up, um, certainly around the borders, but I wouldn't dare um, hang it at this moment. I, I would have to look at it quite closely before I felt like I wanted to, to have it weigh, hanging on its own weight kind of a thing. But I thought it was a lovely rug. I thought it was worth sharing because this is an old enough rug that if you like the pattern, you can pause this video in the future and just peel the pattern off of this slide and, and do it. Beautiful sort of quilted kind of flying geese pattern triangles around the edges. If you see on the left, there's a ghostly tree that I'm sure is the, the, the colors have faded a lot. That black is very strong and true, but funny little character leading the horse, right? Just very, very sweet image, I thought. Gosh, now I feel like I should have gotten it. I don't know. Uh, let me see if there's any other. Um, nope, that was what we started with last time. So let's come back to, what did I say, number 23. Let's return to, I'm going to read that comment that just came in too. Let's return here. Um, let me come back to you for a minute. Uh, just to remind you that we were last week looking at Robin's slides from the Wisconsin Fiber Festival. And if you are going to fiber festivals or you are finding uh, fiber uh, vendors this week, please let me know because I'm so interested in knowing where you're going, what you're seeing, what is out there, what new and exciting things are out there, what things are planned that we haven't missed yet for all of the people who are logged on all over the country, all over Canada, and in the rest of the world. So let's cover as much ground as we can. 23. Thank you, Ryan. And Doreen said, I believe Rangoli Designs is Indian, not Native American. You know, it could be. She said indigenous people, so I, I assume that she meant um, Native American. That's me being American-centric, I guess. Um, but I'm sure you're right. Um, I didn't do enough, I didn't do any reading research. I just was looking at pictures, like a five-year-old. I was just scrolling through pictures. Um, but I'm sure you're right. Um, oh, Haley just wrote me from Loop by Loop. Nice. Um, I got a very nice phone call today, too. So after the show, very nice lady. I think she said her name is Debbie from Canada is on vacation in... Um, Connecticut and she said can I can I come by and see you and I said only if you can handle an incredible mess because I have been tearing it up out there I created another space yesterday in this intense heat uh, so that we have more places to record and more places to stand and more things for you to see behind me and just a different set uh, but she said she was she was very okay with an absolute pig's breakfast so um, she's coming a little bit later and I'll take some photos of that it'll be fun to have a buddy here in the studio with me Number 23, this is where we left off. And I'm sure that I said, um, <laughs> I love this Halloween picture, um, this Halloween hook drug. And did we decide, did we, did, we dis, did we figure out whose image this is designer wise? Do you remember? Because um, I know we were talking about Lori Brecklin and Not Forgotten Farm, and I'm not sure if we got there in the end with whose design this was. Uh, please remind me if so, because I absolutely love it. And you know that I'm very interested in collecting uh, Halloween designs right now. Also, please be sending your gallery night stuff for me so that I can get going on uh, the next gallery night too. Uh, so this would be our next rug. This is such a beauty. Now, what does that say? God, what an unusual rug. So this, I mean, this looks to me, I don't want to make it too much bigger because it'll come away from the it, it'll over over oh it's got writing right around the right around the side if that's legible to you let me know which what does it say which um i'm going to leave it to you i bet some of you have better eyes than me and i think you have a much larger picture this looks to me like uh, people carrying ba obviously baskets on their heads maybe with fruit in it what a lovely composition this is very different um, I have not seen before this kind of a regular shape, kind of in this sort of egg shape oval, um, but tipped to its side. And there is a pattern behind the characters of the same shape that is in repetition. Me too, Ryan. I love the, the, um, the non-traditional shape, asymmetrical oval. It is so different. And you know, the oval being kind of tipped northeast, which came, okay, which came, is it going to be which came first? 
Oh, I bet it's which came first, the chicken or the egg, do you think? Okay, okay, I'm getting it. So there's two eggs and a chicken. Does that seem right? It looks like the person in the middle is holding the chicken and the other two people are holding the eggs. Maybe, maybe that's it. Um, I just love the egg shape, very abstract hooking in the background. I love the very casual bare feet, the sort of farmy attitude of this piece. I love the egg shape. I love how the egg shape going northeast is kind of pulling us with them in the direction that they're walking, right? It's kind of following, you're walking along with them. This is just a hysterical piece. Uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Excellent. Okay, good. Good. We got there in the end. We always do, right? Um, what a neat piece. I, I mean, I can't imagine that this is a commercial design. I've never seen anything like this. If it is, I would love to know if you recognize it. But what a beautiful piece of, per of work. I'll just remind you, if you haven't joined us for the last show, when we were looking at these images from the Wisconsin, <laughs> thank you, from the Wisconsin Fiber Festival, I'll just remind you that on these um on these these slides that I've taken from uh, Robin's photos, there are not tags that tell us who the maker or the designer is. So it's not like we are uh, being very cavalier and omitting that information in the show. That that information is not present at the exhibit. This is certainly that Cushing design again that we saw a lot of at Sauter. The sort of repeat, right? That we saw a lot of people hooking in different ways. This. I don't think we saw this one. There was one at Sauter that ha I don't think this could possibly be the same because I think they overlapped. Uh, but I remember one of them at Sauter did have a lot of red houses um, and only the church was different. So that makes me wonder. But that is a familiar rug and really a lovely rug. This must be a panel that was kind of devoted to uh, holidays, right? And so nice at this time of year going into the holidays. Somebody at the bottom has, let me see if I can lift this one a little bit. Yep, I can lift it. The flag is really pretty nice, uh, very traditional uh, hooked flag, but then with their border, they did proddy. So they just cut up like strips, little rectangles, right? And they just prodded them through or hooked them through. You can either prod it down, right? So push down and then the right side is the underneath side, not the side you're looking at, or you can pull up. So when you're doing Prati, those are your choices. Um, and it makes a beautiful fringe, doesn't it? I've seen some people do trims like this also with fleece, like fleece from the craft store. Of course, it comes in all different patterns too. So, oh, you know what? I don't think we're ready to move away from that. Hold on, let me come back there. Let's not move away yet. Let's look at some of the other holiday images. Very, very sweet. I know I've seen these two images before. Absolutely adorable. A very sweet Santa. I feel like that's a Cushing design. Um, a very primitive snowman with a bunny friend and a nice uh, sort of Charlie Brown tree. And then there's that rug that we were just talking about. That is definitely a Cushing rug. Really nice um, Christmassy panel. This is a gorgeous piece. Wow. So one panel over. Wow. Kirsten, you're loving this, I bet, huh? Um, lots, lots of cats. What a nice, what a nice composition and what a nice repeat seeing that sort of marmalade cat in the middle with the repeat of the orange moon and the sleeping cat on it up in the sky. I love the way that the tail uh, mimics the shape of that sleeping cat. That is really, really neat. Oh, so I think that this one above, I just want to be sure we're get. I'm not, yep, so that's the cats above. And then right below the cats, the meeting will come to order. It is the, I guess, the murder of crows, right? The plural of crows. Absolutely beautiful. That's nice as a seasonal pattern, too, for the fall, isn't it? Going into Halloween. Um, I knew you would be, Kirsten. The stacking of the cats. Uh, this is nice. Two, two in a row that have multiples of, of uh, animals, creatures, birds in this case. Really cute. I like the font on this one, too. You know how we've talked about before, when, when you are designing a rug with words, it is really a feather in your cap if you can come up with a font that is truly your own. Uh, because it is so much fun in the rug hooking world to look at a piece and to be able to recognize the maker, the designer of the piece, at least, by the font. You, you, have, you are really like, you, you have hit a certain level of esteem if you have gotten to the point where your font is this distinctive. I have not gotten to that point. This font is absolutely beautiful. It's very old fashioned. It looks almost like uh, casual calligraphy, but I love the way that the O's look like hearts. That is really, really well done. I love the marble cake background on this too. 
really pretty. Do you know the artist designer of the cats? I don't. I don't recognize that at all. Um, if anybody does, let me know. I have never seen that before myself. That is really, really excellent. Yeah, I love the background too, Beverly on the crows. That was so pretty, beautiful. Another nice seasonal piece. I'm just noticing what a great piece. What a great piece. We were talking a little bit in the Grandma Moses class last night. It was so much fun. I hope that you're signed up for the Wednesday class. It will repeat. It's not a continuation. It's a standalone class coming up on Wednesday. We were talking about the use of horizontal cuts in rug hooking and painting compositions where you run a line like this and it creates a natural laundry line or a line to hang quilts. Creates a beautiful composition idea. This is certainly utilizing that idea. It's a folk, very folky idea. Um, I love the addition of the very three-dimensional addition of the um, clothespins. I mean, isn't that smart? That really is so charming. And I love the bird sitting there on the line too. It has that great trompe l'oeil effect. So, so pretty. Oh, there's a lot of seasonal rugs here. Now, what does this say? Um, quick, it's cold. Help me out with this one too. I've got my I've got my distance glasses on. I can read the January. It's the top that I can't read. Let me know if you can see what that says. This is adorable. This is a hippo on ice skates. We've got some humor happening here. It looks like he's got his ski goggles on and he's got his um, black his uh what's that called black not black watch. What's that called the red and black flannel? Oh um um court corn court something hash. What's it called? Come on, the red and the black, um, something hash flannel, like the food. Oh, it's going to drive me crazy. I hope somebody knows. It has a special name, the black and the red. Anyway, that's what his shirt is made of. Um, and then all of these lovely textured materials making up the scarf and his, his drawers. Uh, really cute image and a textured background. Baby, it's cold outside. Is that what it says? Oh, how fun. Baby, it's cold outside. January. How cute. Buffalo. It is called buffalo plaid. It is Doreen. There is another, we do use another word for it, at least here, that has the word hash in it. It's going to drive me crazy. Um, but also buffalo plaid, absolutely. Um, maybe it's just, ah, I'll come back to it. But the background on this piece, too, is a patterned, uh, probably some kind of a herringbone, black and white. You can see it's mostly black, but it does have that sort of glimmer of white and it gives the impression that there might be some very fine and misty snow coming down. Really beautiful piece. Very funky, very fun, very funny. It's just an all-around standout piece. Some more seasonal pieces here. I see our bird on the right. Uh, beautiful harvest time piece there. Another textured border. It looks like that same kind of black and white. Really, really lovely this looks like a piece to me i'm gonna i'm gonna zone uh in a little bit i just want to be sure before i shoot my mouth off this looks to me like it's done on burlap or linen probably linen and some of the background has been left bare now this is certainly something that you can do on your backing fabric monk's cloth is not so good to do this with because monk's cloth is 100 percent cotton um, it's not such a pretty backing, right? It looks like it's utilitarian. It doesn't look like it's finished in and of itself, uh, whereas linen does and burlap does. And of course, at this time of year, however you feel about burlap, they are selling colorful burlap too. But this is a piece that has been done where not all of it has been hooked, and you're able to enjoy that very mellow, old-fashioned look of that brown, um, probably linen, maybe burlap. But I think that's a nice idea, and that's a nice reminder for us that you don't have to gobble up the entire backing um, by hooking in all those loops. You can think about leaving some of it, you know, bare, something to consider. I'm just bringing you back down a little bit. I don't want to do too much because, oh, okay, we've got an Easter piece here. How cute is that? That's certainly coming from a um, Victorian postcard, without a doubt. I recognize that too. One of these kinds of candy eggs or chocolate eggs that you look in and there's a scene. Beautiful Easter image. Oh boy. Thank you, you. That is something else. I'm going to see if I have another one of that because we need to see that much closer up. Um, I'm going to come back to that because if we can't see it much closer up, 
I'm going to, let me just check right here. Then I'm going to have to pull them. Yep, I think I'm going to be at close-ups of all of these. I'll just, we'll come back to it if not. I don't want to bypass the sunflowers because they're also really lovely. You see, these are two-sided sunflowers. That's a great idea. That's a great idea, isn't it? I haven't seen that before. That's really smart. That's a great image. Let's look at some of these a little bit closer up. We have got our bunny. Really cute. And you know, this is certainly the font that is used on the actual postcard for this. Um, did I miss some comments? No. Um, that Easter greetings, right? That is something that we would see um, exactly the way that it is. Really, really pretty. Hey, oh my gosh, you scared me. Holy mackerel. Um, and here is our thank you, you. Really cute. Um, let me see if I can make this one a little bit bigger. This is super charming. Big, fat sheep, ready to be sheared, ready to be enjoyed. All of that lovely wood, wood, wool. See, I'm all scared now. I heard the door open, but it's Jay, so it's okay. Uh, thank you, you. And there's some hearts in the background here, some beautiful shading. This is an extraordinary piece. Um, I know you all are thinking, is this a commercial pattern? Whose pattern is it? And because these are not marked rugs, I do not know. But if you know, please let us know because I am sure that a lot of us, including myself, would love to have this pattern. Uh, the choice of colors is also like absolutely exquisite. Stand out, stand out. Uh, much more traditional piece to uh, here. This is a basket pattern, but don't we usually see basket patterns as um, just the basket? Whereas in this case, a basket pattern, which is very traditional, has been morphed into a border design. Now that is cool. That is fun. This is a very 1920s looking kind of Sunbonnet Sioux era basket. But when it's transformed into a border design, it really becomes a strong um, a graphic, doesn't it? I love the leaves that are coming out of it. It's very striking. It's very striking. It's done very traditional colors. It's very unexpected and unusual. Uh, there have been very simple scrolls put into that look like the sort of elongated old-time telephones, right? The simplest form of the scroll that's very helpful in, in closing this piece and keeping the focus on those four um, baskets. Really different. This is such an amazing show. I'm telling you, this is if this is what it's like every year, then this is when I'm going to Wisconsin. This is so good. Um, beautiful birch composition on the top left. On the bottom right, look at this. Look at the berries on this. This is really something. These are such strong. They look like, like little blueberries, blackberries. They, they really look like inedible berries, don't they? They look like the kind that are tempting, uh, but that is a huge no-go. The color of the leaves in this is so incredible. All of these oranges and tangerines and rusts in with these soft salmons, wine colors. It's very unexpected very unexpected in the most stunning way. It's very theatrical and striking. I think this color choice, really, really incredible. Yeah, they are lovely, Ryan. They are lovely. I love this tall primitive piece too. I love an exaggerated shape, tall and skinny, whether it's like a yard long horizontal or if it's a tall one like this, I just love these primitive compositions. Lots of padula style flowers, which are these simple nondescript flowers. Uh, a bit of a feel of a Jacobian type design here, a crew work design, but a bit more contemporary, isn't it? A bit more upbeat, lots of little um, sort of reminiscent of Queen Anne's lace, little flecked or flocked white flowers. Um, but the way that the filled leaves are handled is that kind of cool style that we see a lot with the Pearl McGowan designs. That is an another, another really striking piece. Oh, some nice three-dimensional objects too seeing more and more of this, which is so nice. I had a bag that I was judging at the Big E. The Big E is open now, so I've got to get over there and look at look at all that. Uh, but one of the things I had on the judges table was a bag. I was happy to see a three-dimensional object. Uh, just something else, mm -hmm. right? I do have a couple of hooked rug bags, and I'll tell you, it's it's hard to keep them because it is, they, they at least in my world, they take so much wear and tear with the kids in and out of them. I always feel like um, they are compromised in terms of integrity sooner rather than later. But if you have a more normal life and you are not so brutal with your accessories, it's great to have a bag like this. It's, it's not the hooking that's the issue, it's the, it's the sewing that becomes the issue uh, because the backings are so loose. For me, sometimes it doesn't work. But on these pieces, they are lovely. It is great to carry your hooking around in a nice hooked piece like this. 
uh, really different and a lot of variety. Really pretty. We, saw, we used this as our thumbnail for the last show that we did, and we didn't get to it. Talk about lamb's tongues. Um, I mean, this is, this is just staggering. This is a great piece. Very little background showing here. There are actually two backgrounds. Look at the sheep him, himself or herself. Um, I love the posture, right? Leaning a little bit forward, almost like a horse, right? Just a little bit of a forward pitch. Um, and then these big, snowy, cloudy um, circles that comprise the body that are slightly different colors. Lots of interest, lots of layers, very soft. And then a very small black border around the animal. And then a kind of tweedy in between border behind there. Uh, which is a great device going out to these rows and rows of uh, exaggerated lamb's tongues. Right? The scallop design, when it looks this long and skinny, we have now crossed over for sure to the lamb's tongue and not really the scallop anymore. What a gorgeous piece. Um, beautiful proddy piece here. It looks almost like there's embroidery on the border too. That is really, really different. Um, using Prati in a way that makes a lot of sense to me, bringing forth like three-dimensional flowers the way that they would look in nature, that makes a lot of sense. I think I have close-ups of, I do have close-ups of this. I remember, I remember, hang on. So beautiful uh, landscape here, floral landscape. It looks like looking over a garden fence, something wrought iron. It's giving a lot of structure to the bottom of the piece. And all of these Prati flowers blossoming on top, creating so much interest. Look at all the height on this piece. Notice that the border is a sewn on piece of either felt or wool that does have needlework. So what you're seeing, all that fine and filigree work that is not hooked in the border, this is another great option, great idea for finishing, adding a sewn on border of felt or, or wool, and of course you can have wool felt, um, and then thinking about taking out your, putting away your hook and taking out your needle, doing some very filigree stuff like embroidering, um, cruel embroidering of uh, flowers, very filigree flowers and bunnies. Maybe there's a beehive over on the left. It is a really stunning, extraordinary piece. And back to some hooked rugs. Oh, these are just such standout rugs, all of them. I'm wondering, because we're getting to the end, I'm wondering, I've got about, a, yeah, I've got about another 10 to go. I'm thinking, let's start the Wednesday show Let's start the Wednesday show here. Um, I'm gonna go on the Wednesday show. We're gonna pick up where we left off, look at those last rugs, and then you probably got this already. I haven't had a chance to open it yet because we've just been um, going so fast, going so fast. But uh, let's look at this next. It doesn't look like a huge issue, but I bet it's a great issue. I will take it out of its wrapping. I will look at all of the different articles in there, and we can talk on Wednesday about the rest of the slides from the Wisconsin Fiber Festival. And then look at some of, um, I, we're, I'll, I will pull out my favorite parts to the rug hooking magazine, um, the articles that are the most stand out for me. It doesn't mean they're the best ones. It, it meant that those are the ones that appeal to me the most and maybe for you completely different. So I don't want to rush through people's work when people's work is, is, is that good. Um, and I know my buddy's coming from Canada, so I want to be here for her because my phone buzzed a few times. I don't want her to be sitting outside or thinking I, that, that I changed my mind if she's a little bit early. So I will see you on Wednesday. Um, look out on Ribbon Candy Hooking for a few new products I put over the weekend. I know I've got a lot of wool out there. I put another set out there. It's a multi-set, a smaller set um, that's all Halloween. I think it's called uh, Grade School Halloween. It's kind of candy colors for Halloween. It's not your typical uh, black, orange, vibrant purple. It's, um, it's like candy colors with a couple of oranges. Very sweet set with a Halloween uh, flavor to it a few other things, but look out for those classes because Grandma Moses is coming up on Wednesday night. Don't miss that. It is such a fun class. Whether you think you like her work at not or not, we're looking at three artists. She is the primary. She's the headliner. But we're looking at two other artists who started their work very, very late in life for the same reason as well. Uh, and we talk about all of that in class. It's a lot of fun. It's, a, it's another great opportunity to, to be together uh, and to learn something new that you can apply to your rug hooking design and your rug making. And make sure that you are sending me your rugs for gallery night. I'm still deciding if that's going to be this week or next week. But in the meantime, I can use them because I'm putting that show together in my spare time. Ribbon at gmail.com. I will look forward to seeing your rugs. Have a great afternoon, everybody. I will see you on Wednesday for Coffee.